Okay, um, let's begin our today's class. Today's class uh, will not be heavy. It will be very easy to understand. Unlike uh, the upcoming two tutorials, that will be more important. So I repeat, uh, uh, today's class is easy to understand. But when it comes to next week and the following week, tutorial 8 and 9, okay, they'll be very, very important. It carries about like 20 to 30 marks when it comes to your uh, uh, final exam, when it comes to the chapter on monetary policy. And some of the theories on monetary policy itself could be a bit technical right? because uh, some of the knowledge could be quite new to you. But for today's one, quite easy. And the length itself, the duration itself is not too, not too long. Okay, so today we look into fiscal policy. Okay, so first of all, uh, let's do the recap as usual. Now, uh, we talk about fiscal policy. A few things that I want you to know is that this is what we call as demand side policy. What is a demand side policy? Demand side policy basically means a policy that is used to influence aggregate demand, the total demand in the economy. Okay, so we have two demand side policy. One is fiscal policy, and other one is monetary policy. So this is what we are going to focus on in these three weeks itself. One week for fiscal, two weeks for monetary. So therefore, these two policies are what we call as demand side policy because it is used to influence aggregate demand. Now when we talk about fiscal policy, we basically look into these two main components in which we call as common spending and taxation. Now, where do usually these two things being released or being announced? It will be released or it will be announced on every year's annual budget. Okay, so what is budget? Budget is an annual statement. Annual statement of the uh, government spending as well as the government revenue. So it is a statement to tell people about what they are going to spend Okay, for the next year and also what will be the changes in terms of taxation that determines the government's revenue. So here when we talk about government revenue, it is actually derived from the taxation itself. right? So therefore, every year end, you will look into the annual budget released by the government to see what they're going to spend for the next year and to see if there's any changes in the taxation over here. Now, why do we need to have budget being released or being announced um, every year? There are two purposes. First is to finance the expenditure plans of the federal government. So at least there is a plan being uh, released to the residents, to the people, okay, to know uh, so that people are aware of what they are spending, okay, and to achieve macro objective. Okay, so we talk about macro objective. What are the macro objective available? So uh, uh, quick notes as well. So we talk about macro objective. Okay, so we talk about uh macro objective. We do have few macro objective. Okay, so macro objective are the objective that uh most of the government will try to achieve in the country. Like for example, every country would like to achieve economic growth okay how do you achieve economic growth through the increase of the real gdp in the country so that's one of the micro objective right what else so for example the government would like to achieve high employment in the country so that all the resources are being utilized in which it will result in low unemployment in the country in the labor force okay so that's a second macro objective as well okay what else government will also try to achieve a uh, price stability so therefore the price itself will not suddenly go up to sorry oh wrong <laughs> okay, no worries, no worries, no worries. okay 
Yeah. So the prices uh will be stable, okay, so that it will not suddenly go up uh too high in the upcoming years. Okay, so in when we talk about price stability, that means that I want to achieve low inflation in the country. Like for example, three to four percent every year is good. Okay, so that means the if the price only increased by three percent every year, that is okay. That gives an incentive for the producers to produce more goods and services as well, right? So price stability is another macro objective. Okay, we also have another objective called a uh, balance of payment stability. You haven't learned this yet. Pal balance of payment is a accounting record that records all the transactions between one country and the rest of the world. So balance of payment stability means that I look into the export and imports. Okay, so uh, you see, we talk about balance of payment stability here. Uh, like for example, I wouldn't want my country to have too much of money inflow or too much of money outflow. I want it to be balanced, for example. Okay, so for example, you want the money inflow to be very similar with the money outflow. Okay, and I want the value of value of the exports okay is similar to value of imports i do not want any of it to be way larger than the other because uh, we can't always say that oh having too much of export is uh is very good or having too much of import is very bad no it's not always like that okay so therefore we want it to be equal to each other okay but of course it's hard to achieve in reality okay so therefore these are some of the macro objectives that uh government always try to aim for in the country of course, if one day final exam, they might ask you uh, to list out some of the macro objective or to explain any macro objective, right? You can bring in some extra one. Like for example, maybe you learn about poverty. So you say that uh, reducing poverty, tackling poverty is also another macro objective. Yeah, it makes sense. In least developed country, government definitely would like to tackle poverty. As you can see, those uh, poor people are always in the poverty trap itself. So yeah, reducing poverty is also another macro objective. Uh, reducing inequality income of distribution also can. Yeah, that's also another micro objective. You don't want the gap between the rich and the poor to become wider and wider. You do not want the rich to be re way richer and the poor to be way poorer. Okay, so therefore, there are a lot of micro objectives for you to write. But these are the four main ones. Okay, so therefore, we set up the budget to show the people about what they are going to spend and what they are going to earn. Okay, so that we can give and people an idea okay on uh, how the government would like to achieve the macro objective itself okay now when we talk about budget since we talk about revenue and taxation uh, revenue and expenditure so when we talk about revenue it actually it is derived from the taxation itself and expenditure is derived from the government spending so when we talk about budget i use revenue minus expenditure Okay, the revenue that I receive, the revenue that the government received from the taxation and the expenditure they are going to spend. So therefore, when we talk about uh, revenue, it comes from taxation. So we have two types of tax. One is autonomous tax and one is induced tax. Okay, autonomous tax is a tax that is not dependent with the country's real GDP or the people's income. Okay, and induced taxation, the first one over here is what we call as the uh, induced tax in which it is dependent on the country's real GDP or the people's income. Like for example, the income tax, the more people earn, the more they have to pay. So therefore, when we talk about revenue, it comes from taxation and it basically comes from these two components. On the other hand, when we talk about expenditure, is we are looking into government spending. And first, we talk about the government spending on infrastructure, on uh, on on the on the uh, on the uh, what we call it as on the economy. Okay, but at the same time, they also spend on transfer payment. TL here means transfer payment. What is transfer payment? Transfer payment is like those state benefits or unemployment benefits. So a very good introduction of why is transfer payments over here. Please read through it. So transfer payment basically means the transfer of money from taxpayers. Okay, we are the taxpayers. Once we work and earn money, we have to pay a portion of money in the form of tax to the government. And government will transfer this money received from taxpayers to the recipients of benefits and subsidies. So therefore, when you talk about transfer pay, pay, uh, transfer payments, it is a negative withdrawal. Why? Because it is not an injection to the economy. Because these money are not being pumping back to the economy to be spent, but it's actually being paid out to people in the form of unemployment benefits or state benefits. 
Okay, so therefore, like for example, uh, usually we say, oh, transfer payments to be given to some of the eligible people, to the eligible uh, unemployed people, to the eligible households, okay? And we give this money to people in which at the end of the day, the, the, uh, the government do not receive a good or service in return. So this is why it's a negative withdrawal. We give people money, but at the end, there's no good and services being uh, come back in return. Okay, so therefore that's what called as transfer payment. I will put it as a form, a short form called TR. Okay, TR. Okay, so therefore now we come back to here. Now, if today my uh revenue okay is way larger than expenditure, that is called budget surplus. If revenue is way lower than expenditure, that's called budget deficit. Okay, see revenue larger than expenditure means what means that you earn more what than than what you spend. Okay, so definitely it's budget surplus when. Uh, when the taxation that you receive is way lower than government spending, you spend too much. Okay, government spend too much. That's why it's budget deficit. Okay, so when there's budget deficit, that means government may need to borrow money to achieve finance its budget. How do usually they borrow money? They will use bonds to borrow money. Now, how about what? Why is bonds and how they use bonds to raise money? We will learn more on this in the next class. Okay, this is a, a bonds. You will come across it in upcoming classes. You will learn about this in finance as well. Uh, yeah, so therefore, uh, this is a intro about bonds uh, when it comes to next class. Okay, now I want you to look into this mind map on fiscal policy itself. So um, for fiscal policy, not so much of things you need to know. So actually, this mind map is the most important one. So the first thing I want you to remember is fiscal policy is a demand side policy. Why? Because it is used to influence aggregate demand. Either it shifts the aggregate demand curve rightwards or it shifts the demand curve leftwards. That's why it's it used to influence aggregate demand. With the use of what? With the use of government spending and taxation. These two are the instruments. Okay, these two are the instruments. Okay, to achieve macro objective. So you see, there are three keywords for you to define fiscal policy. Yeah? So fiscal policy is a in demand side policy with the use of government spending and taxation to achieve macro objective. Okay, now we talk about fiscal policy. We have discretionary and non discretionary. So I want you to think about discretionary as a layman term. Discretionary means purposely. Okay, purposely. Okay, so discretionary fiscal policy means what? Means you purposely do some changes. Okay, you purposely go and make some changes in the policy itself. Okay, so therefore, when I say discretionary fiscal policy means a policy action that is initiated by the federal government. So there are some deliberate changes in government spending and taxation. There are some deliberate change. What is deliberate change? Purpose, some purposely change. Okay. So therefore, that means there are some changes in terms of taxation. Like for example, maybe by end of this year, government say they want to uh, increase the, the GST tax, for example, or increase the income tax, or increase the threshold, for, for example. So all these got purposely changed one we call it under discretionary fiscal policy. Okay? On the other hand, if I say non-discretionary fiscal policy, that means there is no any purposely change. Okay, is everything being set into the system and it works by itself? We call it as controlled by automatic stabilizers. Okay, so what do we mean by that? Let me read through the sentence for you. So here we say that the changes in government spending and taxation that occur to reduce or offset, that means to settle the fluctuations in aggregate demand without any alterations in government policy. So uh, very simple. Here we are saying that we do not make any changes. We just let the system to work by itself. Like for example, if let's say there are a lot of people being unemployed, then they can automatically to go and claim for unemployment benefits. Okay, when people are are uh, getting better and the country is prosper, then they will have to pay more taxes following the current tax system. So for example, during recession, government spending on unemployment benefits will increase. Okay, why? Because more unemployable people, right? And tax revenue from the corporate tax, income tax, and indirect tax will fall. Okay, because the country is not doing good. So you see, based on the current system, okay, a current system will have the current tax rate and the current unemployment uh, benefits or the state benefit system. So therefore, if the country is not doing good, then of course, we will expect that more people will be claiming for the unemployment benefits or state benefits. And at the same time, uh, there will be less people paying for the taxes. Okay, so therefore, I can use a very simple diagram to show this. Okay, so I have uh, one y-axis and one x-axis. Okay, now let's say on my y-axis, I look into either government spending or taxation. And then on my x-axis, I look into the country's real GDP. 
in which the further it is from the origin, the better the country is. Okay, so therefore, I can assume that the government spending will be a downward sloping line. Why? Because when the country's real GDP is getting larger and larger, that means the country is getting better and better, in which the spending on the unemployed benefits will get less and less and less. Betul? Okay, now on the other hand, the taxation will be an upward sloping curve. Why? When the country is getting better and better with more and more rigid peace being produced, of course, then the taxation that will be paid by the residents will get higher and higher and higher when the country is getting better and better. So what can we see over here? Okay, you see on my left hand side over here, this is my government spending, this is my taxation. So when the country is not doing good as shown by low GDP, the government spending is way larger than taxation. Okay, when the country is at equilibrium, it is what we call as the government spending equals to the taxation. And the last one, when the country is super prosper, okay, you can see the taxation that they receive is super high and the government uh, spending is low. So therefore, here you can see taxation is way larger than government spending. Okay, so therefore, here you can see this is a budget deficit and this one is about budget surplus. Okay, and what we talked about just now. Okay, so that's non-discretionary. Example, so in exam, they might love to ask you example. So very simple, you throw about state benefits, unemployment benefits. Those are the example of non-discretionary fiscal policy or the current tax system. Let's say currently, let's say if they set 10% of sales tax, 10% of uh, service tax, that itself is a non-discretionary one. But if today I say government change from 6% to 10%, uh, that is already what we call as discretionary fiscal policy in which that we are going to talk about. Okay. So now let's talk about discretionary fiscal policy. Okay. Now, again, we zoom into this one and we only see this mind map over here on the left. When you talk about fiscal policy or discretionary fiscal policy, it can be divided into expansionary fiscal policy and the contractionary fiscal policy. Bear, with my, bear in mind with the use of the words as well because expansionary, sometimes I can use the word reflationary as well or I can use the word loosening as well. All these are the same meaning. On the other hand, we talk about contractionary, we can also talk about it as a deflationary or tightening also can. Okay, now the purpose of expansionary fiscal policy is to increase the aggregate demand. Okay, and as for contractionary is to reduce the aggregate demand. Okay, how do they use the instruments to achieve this objective then? So remember, we have two instruments, government spending and taxation. So for expansionary, the government have to increase their spending and reduce the taxation. Okay. When I say reduce taxation here, we have two types of tax, the direct tax, like the income tax, and also the indirect tax. That means the tax that you have to pay when you buy goods and services. So it in includes both of the components. Okay. So therefore, if you show the graph, which we are going to do it later on, okay, uh, the AD curve will shift rightwards, okay? Why? Because these two are going to increase the consumption, investment, government spending, and net exports. So basically, the purpose of this is to increase the employment, increase the real GDP, okay? Increase the economy growth. Okay, so usually expansionary fiscal policy is being applied usually in the situation of a country not doing good. Like for example, if the country is in recession. Okay, on the other hand, we talk about contractionary is to reduce the aggregate demand by how? By reducing the government spending or increase the taxation. Again, when I say increase taxation, it also means increase the direct tax, like the corporate tax and income tax, as well as to increase the indirect tax, like the service tax, the goods and service tax. Okay, so uh, this one will reduce aggregate demand. Why is that so? Because again, this one here, it will reduce the consumption, investment, government spending, and net exports, right? And uh, this one is basically to reduce the uh, real GDP, to reduce people spending too much. So usually contractionary fiscal policy is being applied if only if the country is over booming, in which it is uh, having high inflation, for instance, and therefore contractionary fiscal policy will be applied, okay? So bear in mind with the terms, uh, with the instruments that they use. Okay, so these are things you need to know. Okay, and then moving on. 
to some more explanations about automatic stabilizer, but I've already go through that with you just now. But let me just go through that quickly with you again. So automatic stabilizer works automatically by itself to stabilize the business cycle's fluctuations to help the economy stay at a more sustainable level of GDP. For example, if there is recession, there will be a lot of people being unemployed, income will fall. So the taxation that we receive uh, as a government will fall as well. And unemployed people will access to transfer payments. So once they get transfer payments, they have a bit of income to spend, consumption will rise, and this can help cushion, that means help to reduce, okay, or help to settle a bit against the recessionary effects. Okay, because they got some money, okay? When the country is over booming in inflation, there will be shortages. So therefore, income and consumption will be super high and there will be a danger of inflation. So uh, at this point, higher tax will be imposed Okay, and to remove the over booming demand, okay, bringing economy back to the full employment. That's what we talk about automatic stabilizer. Extra knowledge here. What about the potential problems of fiscal policy? It sounds so good, you know, like uh, you can like for example, if a country is uh not doing good or uh uh like example. Uh, people do not want to spend, okay? It seems like government can intervene it directly, okay? So therefore, it sounds very good that it can actually uh, help the country to either bring it out from the uh, inflationary gap, uh, to bring it out from recessionary gap or bring it out from the inflationary gap, okay? But there will be some potential problems, okay? So like for example, uh, there will be time lags or we'll talk about problems of timing. You know, there's a delay caused by legislative process. You know, it, to, although today, the government would like to uh, pump in this amount of money for the country, but the thing is they need to wait for the budget to be approved first, okay? So therefore, it takes time, okay? So therefore, there could be some delays. And it is very difficult to estimate the multiply effect of a change in government spending and tax rate, okay? You you know, sometimes uh, uh, the effects itself is very uncertain. You know, so today you pump in this amount of money, whether it will really generate that amount of uh, real GDP or not, we do not know. The multiply effect is not always certain, Okay. And there could be undesirable side effects. Like for example, when you raise taxes, huh, people will not happy already one. So it will cause this incentive effect. People do not want to work. So reduce the outputs at the end. And some people will choose unemployed. Okay. And it could be backfire as well. Why? Because an increase in income tax to control inflation may cause workers to seek for higher wages to maintain their disposable income, which will result even higher inflation. And this is a cost push inflation that we are going to talk about later on. An inflation that is caused by the rising cost of production. Okay? Now, these are the bad things of fiscal policy, but the good thing is that it can intervene the market directly. Like for, This is why uh, in US, right, uh, in the midst of pandemic, okay, they're actually uh, using this fiscal stimulus package okay, as part of their fiscal policy to actually help the people. So uh, so that's one of the fiscal policy in which the government give money to people in order for them to be able to have the money to spend in the midst of pandemic to actually bring the country out from uh, from not doing good during that time, okay? But there are some, there are some consequences which we're going to talk about it in the upcoming classes when we learn about monetary policies, okay? So therefore, uh, these are the notes you need to know for the fiscal policy and let's have a look into tutorial questions over here. So question number one, define fiscal policy. So my advice for you to define is first of all, it is used to influence aggregate demand with the use of government spending and taxation to achieve the macro objective, okay? Now, question number two, distinguish between discretionary and non-discretionary fiscal policy and give two examples of non-discretionary fiscal policy. So therefore, this one, the, the answers will be on the mind map, which is uh, this one over here, discretionary fiscal policy and non-discretionary fiscal policy over here. And what are the examples that you can give for this one? You can talk about the unemployment benefits, uh, the state benefits, or the current uh, 6% of uh, tax, or 10% of the sales, 10% uh, of the uh, service tax, for example. Those, the existing tax rate, are what we call as non-discretionary. There's not any change being made. It is being built into the system and we let the system do in uh to, to, to make to make the changes by itself. Okay. Question number three: identify each of the following as part of expansionary or contractionary or not, not part of fiscal policy. So personal income tax rate is lower, definitely. This is expansionary. Right? Because when income tax rate is lower, that means you will have higher disposable income. 
you can then therefore people will be able to spend and invest and therefore resulting in increase in aggregate demand okay personal income tax rate so this one is reducing in the induced tax okay Question number B, government cut spending on defense. Now, although this is a cut in spending, a decrease in defense spending will lead to a decrease in aggregate demand, but this is not is not really considered as a fiscal policy. Why? Because it is not intended to achieve a macro objective here. Because usually you don't really want to cut the spending on defense. Defense is like military in the country. The defense in the country. Okay? So, therefore, uh, although this... Uh, can be considered as a cut in the government spending, but still we don't really call it as a fiscal policy because it does not achieve the macro aims. Okay, the next one. Uh, college students are allowed to deduct tuition costs from their federal income tax. This is a bit like tax rebate. Lah. Okay, so therefore, although this can lead to an increase in aggregate demand, but they still not really considered as fiscal policy. Why? Because they do not have a macro objective to be achieved for this one as well. Okay. Next one, uh, the corporate income tax rate is lower. So corporate income tax rate is lower. Again, this is the induced tax in which it follows by the uh, income that's being earned by the company. And therefore, when the company has lower corporate income tax, this will increase their retained earnings. Okay. And therefore, they can increase their investment, which will increase the aggregate demand. So as part of uh, fiscal policy, expansionary fiscal policy. The state of Slango built a new tollway to expand employment and ease traffic in Klang Valley. So this is more like supply side, I would, I would say. So therefore, this is not fiscal policy. Okay. Okay, some extra questions over here. Okay, so explain how each of the following affects aggregate demand or aggregate supply. A 6% general service tax on consumption is imposed. Service tax on consumption affects the uh, income of people, so reducing aggregate demand. Okay, still manufacturers are given tax rebate up to one million. Now this is arguable. If they use the re more retained earnings to invest, then it can increase the aggregate demand. But if you use the retained earnings to produce more output, then it will increase the short run aggregate supply curve. So it is arguable. Okay, question C: An annual subsidy of five hundred is to be given to households earning less than five thousand per year. This is a bit like uh, the financial assistance. Remember last time during Nanship, that time we have dream, right? So uh, this is something like dream. So it's a financial assistance, a transfer payment given to the low-income households. Okay, so this increased the aggregate demand. Okay, next one. Government decided to subsidize oil companies' production of petrol and diesel. Subsidy. Subsidy is usually given to the producers directly. So therefore, subsidy is... The, the purpose of subsidy is to reduce the cost of production and to increase the output, okay? So to make things affordable for people. So therefore, since this is given to producers and therefore this increases the short-run aggregate supply curve.
Okay, next question. Now, next question, uh, again, you are being a table and you are being asked to analyze. Uh, for those of you who say set one, very difficult one. Now you are being given a table again. So you need to analyze this, this, this like, uh, table itself. Okay, so um, again, you have uh, year one and year two. Okay, you don't see the answer first. Let's try to draw the graph. The final answer is the graph that I show you here, but we have to draw it by ourselves. Okay, and you have potential real GDP, real GDP and price level. Okay, suppose the economy is in the state described by the table above, what problem will occur if in the economy if no policy is pursued? No policy. What fiscal policy tools could be used okay, to combat this problem? So what policy can we use to resolve? Draw a dynamic aggregate demand and aggregate supply diagram to illustrate the fiscal policy in this situation. Okay, we draw the year one first. First thing, we draw year one first and put up all this value. So... First of all, we will assume that it starts from the uh what we call as the full employment, okay? So 11, 11 trillion, price level 100. So I can throw it here. Okay, so draw a straight line, y axis, x axis, okay, aggregate demand curve, and then SAS, and then LAS. So this is my initial point, okay, and 11 trillion at price level of 100. Okay, so this is my price level, origin, GDP, and th 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 this is 100. Don't put the le price, don't, don't put the price symbol, huh? this is price level, so it's index. Price level is index. I don't want to go and put one dollar sign and wrong already. Uh. This is not micro. Uh. Okay. It's index. And then full employment is 11 trillion. So that means real GDP here is in trillion. Okay. And this is 11. Okay. This one you can put dollar sign. Okay. 11 trillion. Trillion of dollars. Okay. So now that's the first thing. You put all the information in. Oh, this one's so shaky, uh. I didn't know that. Like that. Okay, so what's next? We draw the year two one. Okay, year two, the potential real GDP is 11.5 trillion. Okay, we draw that first. So, Okay, this is LAS1, 11.5 trillion. Okay, done. Okay, real GDP is 11.7 trillion. Oh, that means real GDP is way larger than potential real GDP, right? So, real GDP is way larger than potential GDP. So, what is this situation? Inflationary gap or reflationary gap? inflationary gap right? because you produce beyond the capacity potential gdp is your capacity so real gdp more than capacity means inflationary gap okay 11.7 trillion so now that means uh that means that my real gdp okay is 11.7 trillion so that means i have to first shift my sas curve Okay. And my demand curve is increased as well. Because I want to form I want to form the I want to form the uh inflationary gap. Okay, assuming it's a straight line, yeah. I think I can draw better. Hmm. Okay, so eighty one. Okay, so now 
Where is my new intersection? SAS1 and AD1. Ta-da! Here. Okay, so this time I forgot to label. Initially is point A here. Now you are at point B here. Okay, so let me see the questions as well. So the price level is 109. Okay, 109. Okay, so you see, uh, just now I, I have to shift both SAS and AD curve is because what? Because I want to form, I want to form the, uh, what we call as the inflation gap. So I have to shift both SAS and LS, the one that I highlighted to form this, uh, this what we call as the inflationary gap. Okay, so now I want to put up the values. Okay, this is how much? Uh, 109 and then 11.7 trillion. 11.7 trillion and this is 109. Okay. Okay. So now your country is over booming already. Okay, so uh, so now if your country is over booming, what you should do? You should use contractionary fiscal policy to bring it back to the full employment. Okay. So therefore, now, based on the current one, okay, based on the current one, so this is without policy, uh, without policy, okay. Now, I want to bring it back to full employment. So minus of two full employment. So I have to bring my aggregate demand to the full employment and then intersect with the uh, new SAS curve as well. So if you look into my graph, this is my new LIS. This is my SAS remain the same because fiscal policy only shift AD curve. So I'm, my AD curve must later on it, it come back to this point. Okay, so now I shift. Okay, so AD, true. So, it shift. This is with policy, okay? So, uh, therefore, at the end, this is my point. Point C here. Okay, so therefore, what shift this aggregate demand curve is? Fiscal policy. So, at the end, it goes back to full employment in which it is 11.5%. But uh, the price level depends because the line that I draw at the end, this is the price level that I get. This is the price level that I get. But if you follow, let's say this mark scheme, you follow this mark scheme, uh, the price will once it go back to point C here. Okay, once it go back to point C here, the full employment is here, but the price level is somewhere in between. So this one it depends on your graph. Okay, so for me, after I draw, because I think I shift to, because my graph shift a lot. Okay, so therefore, uh, therefore at the end, the price level that end up here. Okay, hey, hi, hi. Yeah, so it will end up here. Okay, but this price level, not so much of a concern. But what you need to know is at least it moved back to the full employment. So everyone will get different, uh, what we call as the different prices level one. So remember, so the price level is uncertain one. So it depends on how you shift the graph. But the, at least you know that it's back to full employment. So, so for this question, no need to why the rate is higher than the actual rate. 
You don't have any reasoning, what? Not like, not, not because what? Uh, okay, why you want to explain why the real GDP is larger than potential GDP, right? Um, how do you know what's the reason? No reason being given. Yeah. Inflation. Oh, impact la. Impact. Just is you have that gap, there will be inflation. Not causes. It's not about causes. It's an impact. You're asking why initially? I mean, like, why year two the so it will go down? Yeah, it's not about Usually, right? But in this scenario, is uh inflation gap in which the real GDP is larger than potential GDP, but we do not know the reason. Okay, but. We only know the consequences of inflation, like what you say. So, so what problem you have after the whole? That's a new one. What problem you have after the economy? Uh, economic policy. Oh, that, that, that means inflationary gap. Lah. This is what we're going to do. Point B is the impact. Maybe it's in fact. Okay, okay, we're almost done ready. We're almost done ready, yeah. Okay, use the ADS diagram to explain the contractionary effect. Okay, so this one. Contractionary fiscal policy on real GDP and prices. Assuming the economy is facing inflationary gap, remember to see the assumption where it begins. Okay, is this an appropriate policy for the government to adopt? Very easy, though. Contractionary fiscal policy is to reduce the aggregate demand, to shift the aggregate demand curve leftwards. Okay, then from point A, move to point B, and then it goes to point C. So now you have to talk about the this one, the real wealth effect, inter international effect, intertemporal effect, and also the incentive effect. Okay, so that's the answer for the graph. You shift AD curve only. Okay, fiscal policy, contractionary fiscal policy. Okay, so what do you need to explain? So if you read the answers, you need to talk about the initial equilibrium, real wealth effect, intertemporal effect, international effect, this incentive effect. And then, yes, it is a good policy because it resolves the inflationary gap. So, answers provided ready. Okay. Okay, next question. Question six. So, IMF says UK should defer spending cuts if growth disappoints. So, they should not cut the spending so early first. Okay, question A. Explain whether... Unemployment benefit is a discretionary fiscal policy or non-discretionary fiscal policy. Okay, so uh, we know this is non-discretionary. Okay, when I when I'm suggested to the UK government to raise the unemployment benefits, is it discretionary or non-discretionary? So you see, uh, initially, if you do not make any changes, it is non-discretionary. But if you want to raise it, then it is discretionary. Okay. So see my answers over here. Okay, utilizing ADS model describe the impact of rising unemployment benefits payment on UK's real GDP. Raising unemployment pay benefits, so it's about increasing government spending and and also this will result in increasing consumption as well. So these two will result in shift in aggregate demand curve. So aggregate demand curve shift rightwards as this is part of uh, expansionary fiscal policy and remember the assumption weaker growth indicates UK is a recessionary gap so we start with recessionary gap this is my assumption okay so now if I were to show on the diagram it will be like this so what you need to write uh, basically I summarize to this this thing only okay first of all this diagram you shift aggregate demand curve and therefore, we talk about the real wealth effect and the substitution effects and the incentive effect. Okay, so what you need to talk about is the movement along AD curve, movement along SAS curve, and then the final outcomes. Yeah. So that's all for the uh today's tutorial questions.